This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. There's a cemetery at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. Rest Haven Cemetery, as it's known, hosts 110 graves within the FedEx Cargo Center, just south of runway 10C. It's a rather odd place for a cemetery, and it's there because it predates O'Hare by a century. It was established in 1840. Up until 2008, it was located outside O'Hare, surrounded by trees. It was verdant, though not very peaceful, thanks to its location next to one of the busiest airports in the world. But there was another cemetery located in O'Hare, just north of Rest Haven. It was St. Johannes Cemetery, home to 1,400 deceased individuals. As you can see, its location right in the middle of runway 10C meant that it had to be relocated during the O'Hare modernization project. The project added four new runways, extended two more, and decommissioned three old ones. It couldn't have done that with a cemetery in the way. Airports aren't the only thing displacing cemeteries. As cities continue to grow, new development may encroach on cemeteries that used to be located outside of town. And unmarked grave sites could be discovered when new buildings are constructed. One estimate puts the number of cemeteries in the U.S. at 25,000, with many thousands more uncounted. That's a lot of cemeteries, and it creates an ongoing conflict between the needs of the living and the resting places of the dead. And sometimes the dead get evicted. Let's talk about the process of moving a cemetery and all the interesting city planning issues around this very unique land use after the bike bell. The Chicago cemeteries demonstrate the realities of moving a cemetery. It's hard to do and best to avoid it whenever possible. St. Johannes had to go because you can't have a curve in a runway. But Chicago decided to preserve Rest Haven even if it meant taking up space in the cargo area of the airport. It was simply too much trouble to undertake a relocation if they didn't absolutely have to. But how does one actually move a cemetery? St. Johannes had 1,400 graves there, and moving them was quite a task. In fact, it was one of the largest cemetery relocations in the U.S. in the 21st century. The largest, as of 2013, was the Potter's Field Cemetery in Secaucus, New Jersey. 4,571 graves had to be reburied to make room for a commuter rail station and a highway exit. But whether 4,000 or 1,400, moving that many graves is a challenge. You can't simply rent a backhoe and a truck and get moving. Archaeologists are hired to ensure that the relocations happen with the utmost care. Remains must be treated with dignity and respect. In the case of old cemeteries like St. Johannes, there may not be much of a casket left after decades of decomposition. Remains must be carefully extracted, often by hand, then deposited in a new box for transport and reburial. It's painstaking, expensive work. The relocations don't happen without consultation from the relatives of the deceased. Chicago staff genealogists tracked down relatives and those buried at the cemetery, which meant in some cases piecing together 160-year-old family trees. Many living relatives had no idea their ancestors were buried there and learned something new about their family history in the process, and they were grateful for that. Some actually were happy to have their relatives moved because the cemetery was at the end of an O'Hare runway and it wasn't exactly a restful place to visit. Others opposed the move entirely, and we'll get to them in a minute. Family members could choose which cemetery to move their relatives to, and the city paid for the full relocation and for new headstones. The total cost for moving St. Johannes was $17 million. You can see why moving a cemetery is something to be avoided, if only to save some money. It's also more likely for a cemetery to be relocated as a part of a large infrastructure project, like a highway or airport expansion, because of the cost. A private developer is less likely to undertake a cemetery removal and probably wouldn't even be able to purchase the land in the first place. But there are many unmarked grave sites and forgotten cemeteries that have created challenges for real estate developers. One developer in Virginia paid to move eight graves of family members that used to own the property. Their graves were in the way of a proposed entrance to the subdivision. In another case, a real estate developer in Georgia didn't spot a small cemetery in the middle of a property slated for 88 new homes in exurban Atlanta. That real estate developer chose to preserve the cemetery, finding it less costly to simply not build a home on that parcel than remove the 22 graves that have been on that land for over 150 years. The cemetery is now locked up behind a fence to prevent unwanted access. These decisions about what to do with small, unmarked grave sites will only become more common as suburban development creeps into formerly rural areas, where it was not uncommon to have a family burial plot. It's one of the stranger and less discussed consequences of suburban sprawl. But what if family members of the deceased don't want the cemetery relocated or don't want it purchased and put behind a fence? They can go to court to preserve the cemetery, and that's exactly what St. John's did to preserve St. Johannes. The case went as far as the Illinois Supreme Court. 
St. John's case was basically that the city violated their religious liberties by condemning the cemetery. This was a pretty smart move on their part, because if cemeteries are essentially religious land uses like churches, they would have additional federal protections under the law. The first set of protections comes from the Constitution itself. The first line of the First Amendment of the Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And the last line of the 14th Amendment reads, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. St. John's alleged that the city of Chicago was placing an undue burden on their religious practice and unfairly targeting them. Furthermore, St. John said that the city's plan to condemn the cemetery violated the Federal Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. That act, which is particularly important to planners, states that, No government shall impose or implement a land use regulation in a manner that imposes a substantial burden on the religious exercise of a person, including a religious assembly or institution, unless the government can demonstrate that the imposition of the burden on that person, assembly, or institution, one, is in furtherance of a compelling government interest, and two, is the least restrictive means of furthering that compelling government interest. It makes sense that religious institutions need special laws like our lupa to ensure that their First Amendment religious freedoms are protected, but the Illinois Supreme Court decided that the city of Chicago was not infringing on St. John's constitutional rights. They were not unfairly targeting the church. The cemetery just happened to be in the way. And the court also stated that our lupa doesn't even apply in this case, because using eminent domain to condemn the cemetery isn't a land use regulation. It's something else entirely. Cemeteries are unique land uses, meant for the dead, but also for the living to pay their respects. But as those loved ones pass away themselves, communities must make a hard choice, preserve the cemetery or give the land over to new development in the needs of the living. Just like most planning issues, there's no easy answer here and every community will need to make that decision for themselves. There's another land use that's also difficult to plan for and touches on some First Amendment issues. Adult businesses. Meaning things like and They are just as fascinating of land uses as cemeteries, maybe even more so. But it's a story I can't tell on YouTube for obvious reasons. But I can tell it and do over on Nebula. That content actually replaces this ad because there aren't ads on Nebula. We're calling this bonus content Nebula Plus and you'll see a lot of it over there, and not just from me. Lots of other creators are doing the same thing. Nebula is great, and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high-quality, engaging documentaries. If you're interested in the suburbs, you'll probably enjoy The History of Home, narrated by Nick Offerman. He takes you on a three-part tour of the history and future of housing, and what makes a house a home. Listening to Nick Offerman talk about the history of the bathroom is a great way to spend some time. Seriously, it was super compelling. We have a deal where if you sign up to CuriosityStream using the link below, you'll get Nebula for free. That's not a free trial, but it's free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they're running a special deal where you can get an entire year for 26% off. That's less than $15 a year for CuriosityStream and Nebula. Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel as well as the dozens of other creators working to make Nebula a success. It's overall just a really great deal too, so go click on the link in the description and get 26% off.